Now, Rock Talk with Mitch LaFon. Welcome to this episode of Rock Talk with Mitch LaFon. Uh, joining me on the phone, as always, at least now, it is a co-host, Alan Niven. Bonjour, Monsieur Alain. How are you? I'm very good today. How are you? Good. Good. We have got an exciting guest because he is Danish, like my mom. Uh, we have got Ronnie Atkins from the band Pretty Maids. They have been around since the early 80s. Still going strong. New album is called Made in Japan Future World Live 30th Anniversary. So years ago, they put out an album called Future World, and then they decided to do these concert tours where they played the album in full. And now we have a live documentation of that. Uh, what is your your take on, on Pretty Maids? Because I'll tell you mine real quick. It's one of these bands like Thunder, like Gothard, like Status Quo, like Rose Tattoo, where within the walls or the, or the confines of their countries and their little space, massive. And then you say, well, how's Pretty Maids doing in Mexico? Meh. How are they doing in the States? Who? How are they doing in Canada? I don't think I've heard of them. Um, I, I, we've had this discussion before, but how do some bands just have 40-year careers everywhere else except in North America? Well, I think there's a couple of ways you can look at it. One obvious way is many a slip between cup and lip, especially when you're overseas. Uh, it takes a lot to break into another territory and get the kind of marketing support that you need to crack a continent like America. Um, you know, in my own personal experience, I look at uh, the Australian Angels, who in Australia were referred to as Thinking Man's ACDC, which some may say is not a very high bar, but actually they were fronted by a guy called Doc Neeson, who was a wonderful Irish poet and a band that made some great, great music and some great rock and roll um, and never translated here. And, you know, out of England, you have status quo, as you mentioned. Um, you have rage. There's also... I suspect with status quo, for example, that they were very happy to be of the status that they were in the United Kingdom and Europe and not in love with having to come over and deal with the American marketplace and deal with the American environment. Um, in my own working, working past, there were the people in the companies I worked out of uh, England and, uh, they found America to be a bit intimidating and overwhelming. So there's probably a little bit of that in there, in there as well. But yeah, there are, there are bands that remain regional and not global, um, although they might have been deserving of being global. Uh, the Angels out of Australia would be num my number one on that. Absolutely. And it, it's interesting because I've had this discussion with Canadian artists, the Honeymoon Suites and Gowan and Helix and all that. And, and Gowan in particular, Lawrence Gowan, who now sings with Sticks, told me, very frankly, that the record company back in 85, 86, 87, when he was doing Criminal Mind and Strange Animal, Moonlight Desire, they came to him and said, listen, we have determined that you are going to be a Canadian band. And they didn't want to send him anywhere. They, they refused to pay for tour support to go to Japan or the States. They said no. And so he calls it, I was sandboxed. And as I talked to Ronnie about this, because I asked him about it, he said, well, you know what? We were signed to Sony Denmark, and all they cared about was Sony Denmark. And it's, did, did you ever encounter that, where, where a record company just said, we're just going to stick them in this, in this box, and we're not going to try. We're just, we're just, they're here. This, this is their market. They get to play Texas. Leave, them, leave us alone. I mean, was that something that you encountered? Was it hard to get Great White over to England, for example? Um a little bit, although we'd done um, a fair amount of work on the first independent EP to be uh, one of the top three import records in the United Kingdom um, when we were pressing the records up or when I was pressing the record up myself and, and working it myself. Um, but, you know, in, in, in anything, in any venture, you will find that there are those people who for whatever reason, do not want to push their sense of boundary and maybe not exert themselves that much. And record companies were no different. Uh, there was a, uh, a Finnish band 
uh, called Havana Black that I worked with. And ironically, they came to my notice because there was a, an executive out of EMI Germany, out of Cologne, who one morning turned up at my house in L.A. Um, to uh, have a beer for breakfast. And he said, you've got to listen to this, you've got to listen to this. And I listened to it, and uh, um, we determined that we were going to do something with them in America and get them over, over into the American marketplace. But the ironic thing is it was an executive out of Cologne and not an executive out of Finland when they were signed to EMI Finland. And um, every now and then, one was aware that one had a little bit of weight so I threw mine and I got them taken off the EMI contract and had them signed directly to Capital in Los Angeles. And that way they were going to get a, a fair and better shot. Um, unfortunately, when it came to the second record, um, it, it was one of those misbegotten ventures. Uh, they were on a tour with Great White and MSG when Jack Russell decided that his drugs were more, were more important than headlining shows. And the tour folded because of the condition he was in. They had to get him off the road to get him healthy and, and make sure that he was going to live. Um, so that, that struck against them. And then when we all moved off Capitol and, and uh, Havana Black were moved on to Hollywood with Peter Paterno, um, I made the mistake of letting the A&R people go ahead with a producer choice, which on paper I looked at and went, that's wonderful, that's a great idea. And then come to find out that the guy was not just incompetent, but horribly arrogant and also fired the drummer before management or the label even knew about it. And he proud that second record, and um, they didn't get the shot that they deserved in America. But if you can find an album called Indian Warrior by Havana Black, it's a damn good rock and roll record, and you'll love it. All right, all right, all right. I'm going to have to check that out. And uh, well, in the meantime, let us check out. Uh, not everything's a, not everything's a, a success, darling. Even if you're, you know moderately competent, and I like to think that I was at least moderately competent, you would run into aspects of the business that were obstructive and non-productive. Um, so when we're looking at, you know, Thunder and Status Quo and Rage and Rose Tattoo and The Angels and Havana Black, um, there were a lot of obstacles that you had to get past within the structure that was supposed to be supporting you. Yeah, and a, and a lot of the a lot of that as I'm finding out with these different interviews over the years is somebody at the record company hated somebody else at the record company and because they hated that somebody else their darling band was going to get the the short end of the stick and and so a lot of these bands didn't get to that next level because they were pawns. I'll and make some, one point on that. Yeah. I'll make one point on that. Um, when you hear somebody saying that, you kind kind of go to the uh, frame of mind of going, ah, you didn't make it. The audience didn't buy you. Um, you didn't. You weren't as successful as you thought you should be. Um, you're making a, a crass excuse. My personal experience is it's utterly valid that uh, executives within companies would use artists and bands as pawns in their own little games of climbing the corporate ladder. And people got royally screwed over at times in the interest of some executives' ambition. And that shit definitely happened and hurt a lot of people. But then you've got a guy running Atlantic, um, Doug Morris, who famously once said, artists are like pebbles on the beach. And when you're dealing with that kind of consciousness, beware. Yeah, that, that's, uh, that's a bit harsh. That's a bit harsh. But uh, let us get to something that is not harsh. It is a singer, Ronnie Atkins, and of course, a Pretty Mates have a new live album. So here is the one, the only, Ronnie. We are speaking with Pretty Mates vocalist uh, Ronnie Atkins. The new album, Made in Japan, Future World, live 30th anniversary. Great, great package. As we say in Montreal, uh, 
But bonjour. How are you, Ronnie? Or in Denmark, good day. No. <laughs> good day. <laughs> tack. Good day. Good, good day. day. Good day. Tack, tack. Uh, but how are you? Um, well, over here it's night, actually. It's about nighttime now. But uh, yeah, I'm good. I'm fine. I'm, I'm actually sitting upstairs in my house uh, watching the sun go down. And uh, yeah, I'm good. I'm in good spirit, man. It's been a good day. It's been a good day. Well, yeah, we'll, we'll talk about good spirits and we'll talk about the news that came out in the fall. But but let's focus on this package, first of all. Uh, you know, bands go out sometimes and they do these album tours and they and they want to bring this stuff to the fans. Talk to me about that decision a couple of years ago where you said, hey, you know what? This is one of our greatest albums. Let us do something special for the fans and let's go out and play this Um Talked about about that decision, and and do you see yourself making that decision with other classic Pretty Maids albums? No, no. <laughs> you hated no, no, everything no, no. about it. It was a horrible tour. No, <laughs> yeah, no, no. no. We, we we haven't had, we haven't even discussed that. But uh, the thing is, we actually did it once before. We did we did with an album before Future World called Red Hot and Heavy, which we did once actually. We just played one anniversary show for that one. But the thing is that we've done these. Um, annual kind of christmas little little christmas tours for the last 10 years actually or even more maybe and scandinavia like basically in in in, in copenhagen uh, in gothenburg stockholm sweden and denmark right and we've done those so back in 2017 we actually suggested ourselves i think that maybe we should do it just to do things differently and just not just swap the set list but maybe play uh, Future World, because it, it was, in fact, in 2017, that was its uh, 30th anniversary. And and we did that, and it was very successful. I think the fans really liked it and stuff like that. And uh, and uh, so so uh, other promoters requested it. And we had a particular request from uh, from Japan to do it, two, two, two shows in Tokyo in, in November 2018. That was actually the fir- 31st anniversary, right? But anyways... We did it, and uh, and uh, a record company wanted to uh, requested us to do it and record it live, and you know, well, that's basically the story behind it, and, and we did it. You know, so we had to go down and listen to some of the songs. It was it was pretty easy because some of the songs from Future World, most of the songs actually, because it's it, it's a it's a milestone for us. It's it's the the biggest commercial album we ever had, the best selling album we ever had. It's from back in the day, from the holy 80s right when there was a big focus focus on on hard rock and heavy metal uh so we just we did we played played a lot of these songs throughout the years so we just basically had to go down and listen to two or three songs that we haven't played one of the songs we never played before but some of the songs we haven't played since the 80s so it was it was pretty easy pretty easy just to yeah, do it really. pretty easy to do. So, so let's talk a little bit about about musically, because here you are, thirty years later. Do, do you listen back to the original album and think, "Oof, we could fix this"? And you know, you get to the live setting and then you tweak it and you you say, "Wow, we're going to add more guitar or more keyboard or more whatever." Or do you say to yourself, "Well, listen, the fans have been used to this for thirty years. Let's just give them what they are used to. We're not going to start playing around with arrangements and." How did you approach it musically? We we actually wanted to uh, no we didn't change anything. We actually we play the songs in the same key actually, and we do, we just, we just wanted to be kind of as authentic as as it, as it could be. So we ne- we never thought about changing anything because it's it's like from for many Pretty Mates fans and followers it's it's a classic album. So why 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 fix it if it ain't broken right? So no, we didn't do that. We just we'd actually just repeated it live, but uh, as it is on record, and and uh, we just had a good crowd. You know, we just had a great crowd because I mean these songs always go down well wherever we play, whether we play in in Europe or Japan or whatever. You know, I mean it's um, so we just we just went in there, you know, to have a party, you know, kick some ass and have a good time with the crowd. That's what we did. So talk to me about the uh, the writing process for for Future World. You come off of Red Hot and Heavy. It, it does reasonably well. Night Danger is used in a in a soundtrack. It it is according to Rock Hard magazine one of the 500 greatest albums of all time. Uh was there a lot of pressure because you did have, you know, you had Eddie Kramer, you had Fleming Rasmussen, you you had sort of the heavy hitters, you know, Bob Ludwig coming in. What was the, the 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 that time period like for you? Was the record company sort of saying, "Hey, all right, boys, you did okay on the first one. Now we got to really step this up." 
Yeah, but we had to, I mean, the thing is, we were signed to like uh, CBS Records, which, which was called back then, that later became Sony Music, right? And we were signed to the Danish department, like like in Copenhagen. And and the thing is, I think that uh, London and New York suddenly had us, looked at us, you know, and they, I think they, it, it took quite a while to write the songs because there, there was a pressure on it, you know, but then those guys started looking and then in the meantime, Europe suddenly had a big hit with Final Countdown and I think uh, um, we were on the same label, right? So I think that the people in London and you say, yeah, we want a new uh, new big band coming out of Scandinavia, you know, and stuff like that. And uh, so so they, they told us to that, well, well, Eddie Kramer produced the album, but Fleming Rasmussen who did Metallica, mixed some of the, the heavy stuff, and then Kevin Elson, who normally did Journey and also did the Europe uh, Final Countdown album. Uh, so we flew off to San Francisco and let him mix some of it. You know, It was like a mix-up kind of thing, but there, there, there was a lot of people uh, involved in that album somehow, You know, but it turned out good anyway. But the, the well, to get back to your question, actually, was, that, was, it, was, was the pressure on? Yeah, it was. But, um, but I think we... We, we we spent in but I mean the thing is when we did Red Hot and Heavy it came out like late eighty four, but nothing happened. It wasn't really released in Europe until a year on, and that was like uh, the fall of eighty five. So we, it wasn't until eighty five we went on tour with the album when we toured with Saxon throughout Europe in eighty five, and then so we basically spent most of the time in eighty eighty six like um, f- trying to finish off that album. You know, it took quite a while. You know, I think we. We met the wall at some time. We had like a writing block, you know, because like, I guess we were a little under pressure to see if we can come up with the goods, you know. But at the end of the day, we 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 did anyway. We, so we, we came uh, to rock, is how they say. But all right, let me ask you this: because you said you were signed to CBS uh, Denmark, you know, one of the thing I've noticed, especially with Canadian artists, is that some are sandboxed, you know, the honeymoon suites and. And Galwin, they're they're signed to whatever Canada, and Canada treats them as a local artist, and that's about it. And they don't really push them out to the States. They don't push them out to the UK. Mm. How was that for Pretty Maids? Were you considered, okay, hey, we've got this cool Danish band, and we will get them to play the whatever festival in Slalza and Aarhus, and they'll go play at a pub in Copenhagen and Bravo? Or were you set up to be an international band? How how would you... The thing is that the thing is that 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 uh, the Sony, the CBS records department in Copenhagen didn't know how to deal with it, you know, and and I've I said that a lot of times. If I could change something, we should have signed directly to to CBS records New York probably or CBS records London. But the time being, when we send out the demos, I mean, nobody knew who the fuck Pretty Mates was, right? So now we were stuck with CBS in Copenhagen and. Somehow there was interest from London and New York, and that's what made it possible at all. I mean, otherwise we wouldn't have gone to America to record uh, the Future World album. So it was, it was, diff- it, it, it definitely was. There was, there's, there's a big difference in coming from a little country like Denmark or coming from uh, England or America. I mean, if you're signed to London or New York, you're, you're in a slightly different position than you are if you're signed to a little label in Denmark. Even though there's something called CBS Records or Sony International, but but that 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 was how it was back then, you know. We basically were involved with the, with the wrong people, and it's not. I'm not just talking about record company. I'm talking about management and stuff like that because we didn't know the guys back then, you know. It wasn't until um, later that we realized we, we we had this Danish guy that we really trusted in, and and you know, but he 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 would just take it to. To take us to a certain point, and then that was it, you know. But then again, he was connected to other people that made it made it possible for us to tour with Saxon, to tour with Deep Purple and stuff like that, Black Sabbath, which we did. And, All right. and, you opened and, for Kiss, which is important. Yeah, but that was <laughs> Kiss was just a couple of years ago, actually. And yeah, know, it was 2017, it, and it was one yeah. show or two shows, but still, you opened for Kiss. Yeah, I, I've fun. never opened I mean, for Kiss. We opened up for a lot of our, our big heroes in, in our time, you know, but I mean, um, but yes, but that three years ago with Kiss, you know, it was fun, you know, because we were all Kiss, big Kiss fans, you know. Uh, but back then and back in the day, you know, touring with, well, the first tour we did was in 83, it was Black Sabbath with Ian Gillen was in the band. And actually Ian Gillen did a lot 
for us. You know, he recommended us to, after we opened up, that was the first contest he and Gillen ever did. I was in, in, in Oslo, in Norway, where we played with him in something called Drum and Holland. That was the first night he and Gillen ever played for Black Sabbath. But he liked the band and we spoke to the guys. I mean, I couldn't believe it. I was talking to Giza Butler, Tony Iommi, Ian Gillen. I mean, come on, my heroes. I was, I was a huge Black Sabbath and Deep Purple fan back in the day, you know. Very big part of the reason why I'm doing what I'm doing. Um, so it was just enormous. And actually, Ian Gillen introduced to a guy called Tony Wilton, who did something called the BBC Friday Friday Night Rock Show in London. So when we came to London later that year, um, like like just as a club band playing Pops and Clops, you know, he actually introduced it to Tony Wilson. So put us on the C, uh, BBC Friday Night Rock Show, and that started something, you know. Yeah, so, did. Uh, and by the way, you, you, you had Roger Glover and Ian Pace and Gillen Guest on your record. So that's got to yeah. be one of those where you just go, man, I got the guys from Deep Purple on my record. Like, how cool yeah, is that? How cool is well, that? That is, that is so cool. That's how cool it is. It's so cool. You know, I mean, if, I mean, when I was listening to, I mean, when I was, when I was listening to Highway Star and stuff like that, you know, and I was like, back then I was thinking, well, I, I wouldn't even think that would ever be possible you know but it just happened by coincidence because uh, you know we toured with deep Purple, well the future world album we toured with deep purple they had the album house of blue lights out and uh, we toured with them in uh, in europe and uh, there we got to know the guys and they were always very very friendly to us and so we so we passed roger some tapes we had some of some demos and and he wasn't particularly totally hooked on a song called savage heart and then we ended up with uh, Roger Glover coming to our little hometown here in Denmark. We did some pre-production. We went to Roger's place in uh, Connecticut, stayed there for two or three weeks, and, and then back to Denmark in a recording studio. And But that was not for the Future World album. No, that was for we Jump the Gun. The next up. Yeah, for those for Jump the Gun. But but anyway, it was so funny when I mean, hang around with your old heroes, you know, and just actually realizing that, uh, well, well, they're just human, you know, <laughs> but, but it was a good photo. Roger Glover was one of the most funny persons I ever worked with. What a, what a humor, man. What, well, a, what a great guy. Yeah, I, listen, these are not questions I had in mind, but let me ask you this. When you're touring with Ian Gillen, who's considered one of the greatest voices in rock, hmm. and, and you're at that time a rookie, I mean, you, you know, it's early in the 80s, you're, you're still developing as a singer and as a stage and do you go out there and study him and, and does he come to you and say, hey, listen, I saw your show. Maybe you should do this. Maybe you should try that. Maybe you should stand. Like, did, was that a learning experience or was it, nah, we're just all drunk and nobody knows? And like, how was that? Yeah, it was probably all drunk and nobody knows. No. <laughs> <laughs> probably. <laughs> I was, but, but absolutely. No, 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 no. We never talked about that. I mean, I was just, I mean. I don't. Well, I don't think I ever talked about Ian Gillen about singing. Actually, I probably, if if anything, I probably asked him, "Oh, do you do anything particularly when you warm up or anything like?" That? I can't remember because Ian Gillen was an extremely funny guy, and he, him and Roger together, I mean, was uh, telling old stories, and he was just Ian Gillen was a. I mean, we had one of the most crazy nights I had when he did this Christmas uh, uh, thing we did back in '90. It just happened by we went in to see Gillen playing solo. In a club in in Copenhagen, it wasn't it was a big place, and we went into a bar afterwards. He was there, we were there, and we said hi, and we remember we talked about the tour a couple of years before, and then we ended up and said, "Hey man, we're doing this uh, this this Christmas single kind of thing, you know, you want to join in?" Yeah, sure, man. Drunk as a skunk, you know. So we went out there, sitting in the studio all night, having just having fun. I actually have videotapes of it. I would never publish that, but. But it was just, uh, just so funny. It was so surreal that you're sitting there. That like just ten years before that, you were like, I, you know, drooling when you listen to Highway Star or Child in Time or something like that. So it, incredible, and and that was just an example because I met so many of my old heroes in this business through the years. And every time I get, uh, I never really been really disappointed. Got to say that people has always been very nice. Yeah, they they have been. Uh, l let me go back to to my original train of thought, though, with this thing about being a Danish band and 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 being maybe sandbox. You know, the band's been around or, or early early form since eighty one, eighty something like that. Uh, great band, great albums. Just you keep hitting it out of the park. The, the last couple of albums, Kingmaker, just fantastic stuff. 
what was the one thing that kept you from being a Def Leppard in, in, in North America, from being a Bon Jovi in North America? Because there are great bands like yourselves, like Gothard, like Thunder, who have these great careers in Europe, and then you come to, you know, Des Moines, Iowa, and you go, yeah, I don't know who these guys are. Where, where did it not translate? Well, I think we have to go back to what we talked about before right. about being on a label label in Europe and not in America, you know, because it, it's little things that makes the difference. Because if because I mean, I can tell you an example of what have in our career back in '87. I, I told you we we toured with Deep Pearl. We had the whole uh, European uh, tour. We're doing playing uh, with Pearl, big, big, big venues, big uh, festivals. We did the Monsters Rock festivals back then, and to this day. If we haven't done that, we wouldn't have the name we have, for instance, like in Germany or, or let's just say basically in Europe today. But at the same time, we were asked because Future World, the song and Love Games, those two songs were the videos from that album, right, were on MTV and getting pretty good rotation. And we had an offer to go out with Whitesnake for three weeks in like May, June uh, 87, which we had to decline the offer because we were already booked on the purple thing. You see, if we did that, if we went out with White Snake back then, we probably would have jumped from that tour onto another tour, maybe with Motley Crue or whatever. I don't know, whoever, Cinderella, who the, the you know, the top bands were back then. And who knows what would have happened, you know? So, so it is like coincidences and, and it's, it's very much the fact that, um, like, like a band like Thunder or Got Hard, never have a chance and and to break to make it in America. So I mean, what was I mean? The, it's both bands are really good bands, you know. But I mean, I I think it's a, it's a matter of uh, destiny, faith, whatever. I don't know destiny. I mean, being there at the right time or the right spot, seen by the right people, you know, and say, hey, I want this band. I want to sign this band, you know. Because I mean, if those bands or us for that matter had been signed to an American label back in the 80s we probably we probably would have been a different story I think yeah quite possibly uh, I do want to take you just real real back here to the uh, album stripped in 1993 acoustic album it's a fantastic album it's just absolutely I adore that album it, it talked to me is, is that how you sort of approach your songwriting now I know you've got a couple of covers on there and the but do you, when you sit down to write a song, does it have to translate on an acoustic guitar? Is that one of the ways you sort of put music together? Well, it's it's like um, it's it's like if if it, we always used to say like a good song is a good song, you know. If it sounds good on an acoustic guitar, it's good, you know. Because I mean, me and Kenny used to write songs like he was he might be sitting with an electric guitar, I was sitting with an acoustic guitar. Or we both sat with an acoustic guitar. If it sounds good that way, you know, it it it, it normally is good. You know, it, it ends up good. It, it's a matter of package. I mean, I'm telling you, some of the songs we've done in the past were written that way. Um, and then you go into the studio. For instance, in recent years, we're working with Jacob Hansen, for instance. You know, uh, we there were songs like "Bullet for You," uh, "Sad to See You Suffer from Motherland." You know, those those kind of songs. That were basically written on acoustic guitar, really pop songs, just pop songs. But you can go in, you go into the studio, let, let somebody else listen to it and say, what could we do, you know? We knew it was a good song, but let's kind of produce it into being suitable on a Pretty Mates record, you know, so make it fit. And the same thing, the, the, the thing about Strip is a different story because we did we did the Syndicate album and it became huge here in Denmark and Japan. We had a huge hit with a song called Please Don't Leave Me the electric version, right? So they wanted us to do like more of that kind of stuff, but we really don't want to go pop, but we had a lot of these ideas. So we did an album called Offside, which was like five five songs or something like that, which also went very popular in Japan and in, in, in Denmark, and no, basically in Japan. And then the, then the European part of Sony Music wanted to say, why don't you do a whole album? And at the time being, we were not happy being on Sony Music Denmark. So we we made the deal if we make another five or six songs and we put out put out a whole album which is stripped, which be, which which would turn out to be become stripped. Uh, you're off the deal, you're out of the deal, and you can do whatever you want. And we agreed to that because that's what we wanted to. So we did that album, which I still think to this day it's a good album. It's, it's a lot of good songs, but it's it's far away from. What we've done in the past, you know, it's not a metal album, it's not a hard rock heavy, it's not distorted guitars and stuff like that. 
But we did it and we got out of the deal. But we also confused a lot of fans who were saying like, what the fuck? What, what is this? You know, what are these guys doing? You know, so uh, but I mean, today, I think the album turned out to be some kind of a kitsch cult thing. You know, I think people today, people has kind of accepted it. You know, I thought it was a great album back then. And it's probably the, it's the best selling album we ever did in Denmark, which wow. sells a lot. You know, it says a lot, you know, but it is. We had a gold record for that for that one uh, in Denmark, you know. But outside, I mean, in Germany and uh, especially in Germany and Japan, and, and people were confused. You know, what is this? Is that like a new direction? But at the time being, there's a lot of people doing these unplugged albums, you know, on MTV, MTV unplugged, you know, even heavy bands and stuff like that. But um, but that's the story. And I like uh, we them. got we. we I, I, I like those albums. So I, I do want to ask you about this Me because Me too. You, you touched upon sound. You know, you look at certain bands like ACDC and stuff and they have their sound and you know what an ACDC song is. But then you have other yeah. artists like a Madonna, like a U2, where every album is something completely different. How sort of tuned in are you to that where, you know, you get to, you know, you've done Undress Your Madness, you've done Kingmaker, you think 2021 – do you have the freedom to go make the album you want to make? Or do you have to be, all right, we have to make Future World Part 2. We have to make Jump the Gun. Like, do you have to be Pretty Maids forever? Or can you stretch what you do? Oh, we don't We don't have to be anything because we've been there, done that, you know. We served, uh, well, personally speaking, I've, I've, been, I've served in this band for 39 years. Or, yeah, something like that, you know. I don't have to do That's anything. A lot of I, years. I do it. It is, and so have we all. Me and Kenny has right. Yeah. So we don't we don't have to do anything unless we like to do it, you know. And now we did undress your madness. The first time we're not even talking about doing a new album because uh, we haven't played a song live from, from undress your madness. Partly because of my illness, and then the corona thing on top of that, right? So that just fucked up everything. So uh, we're not going to do anything as. Well, not with me included, though. I can say that for sure. Until we we played some gigs with uh, Andres Jimenez, but I think everybody is uh, today have, in this uh, quarantine times. We haven't seen each other for a long, long time now. We speak on the phone, but I think everybody is working on their own individual projects, whatever they want to do, you know, which is cool. You know, we've been here. No, I th but to go back to your question. As pretty mates, I think pretty mates just sound as pretty mates just sounds like. Uh, we wouldn't go and do. Uh, um, like an, an album that was completely different, a totally right. different style. I wouldn't do that. Not not if I. That's my opinion, right? You know, and I, and I think uh, Kenny would definitely agree on that. That wouldn't be right. You know, people can do whatever they want to do. If I did a solo album, it wouldn't be totally like Pretty Mates. Right? Why would I do it then? I might as well do another Pretty Mates album. But but because uh, I write all kinds of stuff, I write a lot of stuff on uh, piano these days, and it just turns out different. It's still good. I think it's good songs, it's pop music, but but uh, again, you can produce it into whatever you want it want it to be. But I think as pretty mates, uh, I think we would stick to um, what we've done the last to, ten years to your sound. Less, you know? yeah. And by, and by because, the way, Kingmaker was a monster of an album. Holy mackerel, that was good. I mean, thank you. Boy, that was a good. Uh, you did mention quickly the illness, and so I, I, I will uh, just quickly ask: uh, diagnosed with lung cancer last year, are are you better? Is it improving? Can you sing? You know, is your voice okay? Um, yeah, comment. I mean, I, I, I can sing. I, I just did a, you know, this project with, which is the first thing I've done like for, yeah, for nine months. I did this project called at the movies, and it's out on YouTube. Where oh, I've actually of, seen those. Those, yes, those are great. Yeah. that's right. You're, I, well, yeah. And I, that was my first. I did the like, uh, we don't need another hero by Tina Turner. Which, yes, yes, <laughs> which I posted that on my Facebook. Yes, that was great. Cool. Yes. But that's the first thing I've done, and that was a was a great relief for me to do that. Actually, first of all, it was like fun to be part of this, and, and like a favor to my friend Chris Laney. But um, but it was great for me just to get out of the house, you know, and do something. It was the first public appearance I did anywhere. It was the first time I really tried out my voice and see if I could pull it off. Because one thing is being at home, go and sing and do it with my dog yelling and screaming at the piano or whatever, you know. Yeah, but I can still sing to answer your question. Yeah, I can. I still got the pipes, uh, more or less. I mean, I lost, like, to tell you about the disease, I lost, like, 20% uh, of my lung capacity, you know, but I'm, I was in pretty good shape already. So 
I don't know how it is to be on stage for an hour and a half. I don't know. I haven't tried that yet. You know, but and talking about the cancer itself, you know, lung cancer is lung cancer. And if you go in and read the statistics, uh, the odds are not on my side. You know, that's the way it is. I, I said publicly a couple of months ago that uh, that I was uh, that, that on the scans I'd taken back in February, March or February. There was no cancer more to be seen, but you know, you never know. This is, I'm, I'm being scanned. I live my life in stages. You know, every three months, I'm going to go to a scan, and it's like the antelope on the savanna, as my psychologist says. You know, it's like you, you, you the, this, you feel like this constant threat, like a gun against your head. You know, I have to say, it, I have to learn to deal with this new reality uh, mentally, and. Um, I'm, my mother died of lung cancer when she was the, my Oof. age, actually. You know, so but it's not like it's not gonna. I mean, the, the, it's not gonna supersede my uh, the the time I have here on earth. You know, I mean, I'm I'm not like I'm positive. I have a positive mindset, and I'm not like gonna sit down in the corner and say I'm, I'm gonna die. You know, maybe I am gonna die. I don't know. I don't want to know, and I don't know. I don't want to know when. But I, right now, I'm feeling damn good, and I'm. I'm in good spirit and everything, you know, and I, good, good. I feel super good. Well, so, I mean, what can I say? I enjoy every day. I've got to learn to live in the now. And actually, that, thinking about it, in hindsight, I always lived in the, in the now. You know, that's probably where I am. Where I, that's why I am here. That's why, that's why I ended up like this, you know. But uh, no, but I, I'm just, it makes you think. It makes you appreciate life more than you probably did before. Just little things and stuff like that, you know. Yeah. I think we all used to take things for granted. And then this coronavirus on top, you know, it makes you even think even more about it, you know. It really does. It, and and yeah. sometimes, you know, sometimes bands fight over the silliest things, you know, who got the bigger towel at the end of the show or the shrimp was too small. And then you look at all that and you just go... No, but that's yeah, not going to change, Mitch. That's not going to change. <laughs> You're still going to fight with the band. <laughs> well, all right, and let's finish on this because we, we, we're at half an hour. But uh, last yeah. year, May 23rd, 2019, you were at the Metropolis in Montreal uh, with Avantasia. And mm. it was one of the greatest shows I have seen or I saw in 2019. You know, I went in with, all right, let's see what's going to happen. And then, you know, Jeff Tate. And then you. And then Eric Martin. And and it just it it was nonstop. It was just nonstop greatness. Um, talk to me about that that tour. Having a chance to actually play in North America in these larger venues, and w was that sort of okay? We've been there, done that. Or do you set time aside or for next year? Or you know, if if Tobias calls you, are you there? Absolutely. I mean, uh, I had so much fun doing this uh, Avantasia thing. I joined the first time in 2013, and uh, and um, for me, it was just fun to do because it was the first time I did anything outside of Pretty Mates, and it was good because I actually Tobias asked me. Um, all the way back in 2099, he called me and I said, I am Tobias Samet. I'm from this band called Ed Guy. And, and I didn't know who the fuck Ed Guy was or who Tobias Samet was, you know. And, and I wouldn't have done anything outside of Pyramids back then anyway. But I've done this so many years. And the great thing for me in Avantasia is that I am not the focal point. I mean, I'm not the major star. I mean, the thing is that that's the biggest project, right? But we all have our little spots to shine, and it's just good fun. So for me, it's like kind of a, besides the fact it's all great, fantastic people, for me it's also uh, 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 kind of like, a, it's kind of like a paid vacation, a very enjoyable vacation. And for me, it's great to meet all these great singers and musicians, you know. So it, it's been uh, wonderful to do it. And uh, so if we were supposed to, to play here, and they were supposed to do some festivals here in 21, but... Uh, no, 20, but that's that's postponed until next year. So what's going to happen? It, again, I don't know, but um, I'm not out ruling anything. I, st I, st I spoke to uh, Tobias the other day. I mean, we still talk to each other. I still talk to my Aventasia friends as well. Absolutely. And and you got to uh, to share a lot of time on the road with uh, Mr. Biggs, Eric Martin, and there's that's got to be the funniest times of your life. Uh, I will remind folks, a maid... In Japan, Back to the Future World is available. Uh, live 30th anniversary, let's not forget that, is available now. Uh, Ronnie, yeah. always a pleasure. It was a pleasure meeting you last year at that uh, Avantasia show. Pretty Maids, to me, is one of these bands that shoulda, coulda, woulda been as big as any of these other bands that have made it in North America. But listen, I, I don't care. 
you're I love you. So always a pleasure. Thanks, man. Always Good to a hear, Mitch. And uh, let's do hear, this Mitch. again soon. Nice talking to you, man. Nice talking to you. And I hope, yeah, I hope, I hope to see you on American soil. We're pretty nice one day. It'll be great. Uh-oh. Or Canadian soil. You know? yeah, but listen, anyway. There's a great yeah. M3 festival uh, every year here. We got to get you on that M3 festival. That's, that's going to be a goal to get you on that M3 festival. That's the goal. We got a deal. There you go. That's the goal. Merci, right. monsieur. Thank you. As we say, uh, tack. Tack, uh, tack, skidahue, or whatever we say, tack. And what, I, what do I say? I say, still tack. There you go. That's Cheers. Me. Bye-bye now. Oh, cheers, man. Cheers, bye. Bye-bye. Ever wonder what Vince Neal would sound like if he was a black belt in Taekwondo? <laughs> what about what his favorite McDonald's menu item is? Just hold the pickles. This is Rock Talk with Mitch LaFun.